Hi, today we have something special at the shop. This is a Newtone Model 2500 receiver. Uh, it's also in some installations called the 2600. The 2600 was a music only version of the 2500 system which would have music and intercom stations. This is not considered to be the master station of the system. This is actually the Model 2500 receiver and receivers typically have amplifiers, preamps and a tuner and also audio inputs for auxiliary devices. The 2500 system could have included along with the AM FM tuner, there was a cassette tape option, there was an 8 track player option, there was also a record changer and record storage and then a variety of speakers. You'd have stereo speakers throughout the house. You could also have the option for mono speakers in different rooms. The master center would typically be the tuner, your auxiliary, either cassette or 8-track player, and the phonograph with some record storage alongside of it. And then you could have built in the wall cabinet three-way speakers at either end. Uh, when it was done in that configuration, it would give you what used to be called a whole wall of new tone. Altogether, it would be about five feet long across your wall and a little over 36 inches high. So it was quite a massive unit when it was installed. Or you could have ceiling or wall speakers mounted somewhere else in the room. The receiving unit has no speakers built into it. It's just an ANF and tuner with control. So this was sent in by John from New Jersey and his report is it's in pretty rough shape right now. So I have it set up here on the bench for a little initial testing and this video is going to be multiple parts as I work through it. These are a fairly complicated model to work on. There's a lot inside of it and there's a lot to do. So it will take several videos to show you what that's all about. Fortunately, back when this was new, Newtone made a test setup for this, which made bench service a lot easier. The test setup compri was comprised of a separate power transformer, which would plug into the socket on the back of the unit, and then a modified cable assembly, which allowed you to connect up some speakers on the workbench. For today, I just have it hooked up to a pair of 5-inch Newtone 25 ohm speaker cones. These are just for testing as I work on it, and then when we get it complete, we'll test it with some proper in-wall speakers from this system. I have it transformer plugged in. Let's take a quick look at the receiver itself, and then we'll plug it in and I'll show you what happens. John 2500 receiver has a manufacturing code date on it of 1980, which is later than I've seen in the past. These models were really popular in the mid-70s, so this is somewhat of a later one. Uh, the date stamp on it also corresponds with the date code on the four output transistors, which are on this end of the chassis. These are all Motorola devices, and they're dated the 13th week of 1979, so that corresponds pretty closely with the manufacturing date from Newton. So what we have here is an AM-FM receiver. We have controls along the bottom panel, we have an on-off volume control. This is a true on-off switch. When you turn it and it clicks off, the entire system is powered down. You have balance, which is left and right, because you have to remember this is a stereo system, so you have two speakers in each room. You have treble, you have bass, and then your input selector switch. The input selector switch gives you choices between an auxiliary input, a tape input, a phonograph input, then you have built-in FM, AM, and what's called REM. REM stands for remote. The 2500 system had a unique feature, which we'll cover in a later video. It allowed you to mechanically change preset radio stations that were set on the 2510 master station. And when we get to the master station rebuild, which John sent along with his 2500, I'll show you how that is set up. It's a pretty interesting design. And then down here we have some auxiliary controls. We have AFC, which is automatic frequency control, which can be off or on. Automatic frequency control helps prevent the FM signal or the FM tuner from drifting. You have loudness off or on. When loudness is on, uh, I haven't looked it up, but it probably adds about 8 dB of bass into the system. You can play it in either mono or stereo. This has to do, this doesn't have to do with the amplifier, this has to do with the tuner. A lot of FM radio stations will come in better 
on mono than they do on stereo. So if you have a weak station, you can select for the clearest sound. And then you also have record and internal record. Record would be from an external source. Internal record is if you were recording on a blank tape from the tuner or something like that. Oh, you also have a headphone jack. I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually use a headphone jack, but we will be testing that as we work along with it. You have the AM and FM tuning dial here with an FM stereo lamp indicator built in. It's green and it's a nice design. You actually have a little bit of what's called gyroscopic tuning effect on the mechanical tuner. There's an actual flywheel and it's weighted inside so when you turn it you get a little bit of momentum from your turning of the knob. It was something that was very popular on sort of high-end home hi-fi equipment back in the day and uh, Newton sort of copied that a little bit. There also are some, di or some dial lamps in here that light up the dial uh, when it's dark in the room. So that's pretty interesting. These were a very expensive system and you don't really see that many of them. One of the things that's kind of interesting on this system is actually the power transformer. This is actually the same transformer that would have been installed in the wall housing behind this unit during construction of a new home. And this is a pretty massive transformer. It has two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are eight taps out of the transformer. It's applying different voltages to different parts of the system. As a comparison, this probably weighs about four pounds and it's huge compared to, here's a standard Newtone intercom transformer from the same time frame. This probably weighs about uh, four or five ounces. It, I would say roughly one quarter of the size of this transformer. This was always a problem because of where it's mounted in the set, getting it out is very difficult and that's one of the reasons I think Newtone came up with this service kit is it would have been quite a chore for a serviceman to have to go and remove this from the wall housing and take it back to the shop with you. So these kits were available. So let's go ahead and turn John's 2500 receiver on and see what we get. And I've got it set, set to FM. And the reception seems to be... Not exceptional, but not horrible either. I think what we're really going to find though is, I'm going to flip it over to phono input. And if I turn it up... You have a lot of hum on the system. The other thing which I noticed right off is right channel it's got a lot of problems. Left channel speaker, nothing coming out at all. I have a feeling, I know that the balance knob is broken, so if I turn it manually to left, I've got nothing. So the left channel seems to be dead. Right channel has a lot of AC or uh, DC buzz in it, uh, which is bad. And obviously this is in really bad shape. That's why John sent it to me. So I'm going to disassemble it partially to take a look inside and show you what that's all about. So welcome to the insides of a Newtone 2500 receiver. What you have to do to work on a unit like this is disassemble and open the chassis up. The chassis is made up of the front metal plate. There's a bottom plate. Then there are two assemblies on the back and then you have the end caps. And to work on this, you have to remove all the screws that hold the chassis together into its cube shape and then sort of fold it open to gain access to the circuit boards. And the problem with this type of design, or the problem with working on one of these, or maybe I should say the challenge of working on one of these, are all of these interconnecting wires. There's a lot of power wires and other interconnecting wires that go from board to board. And what you end up with is this tangle of wires in the center of the chassis. And this makes working on the set challenging. Some of the cables have little plug connections on the ends, like this little violet colored one right here. I can actually reach in there and unplug it. 
And this is basically sort of a little Molex receptacle here. It fits on what's really a little Molex connector pin down there. And you can unplug it, and if you mark it, which is important because you'll forget where it goes, then when you're done with having it off, you can plug it back in, and that's all great, and that makes it a little bit easier. But a lot of these wires that come primarily from the power supply and then some of the interconnect wires, these travel from here and go down. And for instance, this yellow wire, this is soldered to the board. It's not going to come off. You can't just unplug it. And you can't really go through and desolder all of the soldered wires and mark them and then put them back where they go. It's a lot of extra work and it doesn't really pay out in the end. So everything you do on a set that's as old as this one is, you have to be very conservative about because your job is to fix it, not make it worse. So let's take a quick look at what we have. In the back of the chassis, we have dual amplifier boards. This is what they call A channel and B channel, or it would be right and left. And these are identical boards, and they're connected to the output transistors, which are on this side of the end of the chassis, and I'll show you that. Here you have the primary power supply, and it's, the, I guess, the primary power supply because it's the only power supply. And what you have here is this, this silver, this is a large multi-section CAN capacitor. There's two more down here that are multi-sections also. You have these big orange capacitors. These are probably Sprague brand because Sprague liked orange. Um, you have a variety of diodes and, and resistors. This little resistor right here is already burnt in half. That's not a good sign. Something's been overloading it. Back here, you have a two-channel preamp board. This is for right and left. And these are, for the most part, mirror images on each half of the board. Uh, they just put both channels on a single board. Down here is your intercom preamp board. Off here on the side, this is your FM RF tuner. And as a point of interest, this is the same tuner assembly that was used in other early and mid-70s Newtone intercoms, like 2090s and 2540s. And then down here, I'll move the camera so you can see this is the FM IF board, which is unique to this model. So this is the FM IF board. And then here we have, this is the FM multiplex board. The multiplex board is what allows stereo reception to be possible without a multiplex board. You would only receive in mono FM. Here is the FM stereo indicator light socket that you see through the front dial assembly on the front of the unit. As an important note, this the bulb in this, this is a small incandescent bulb. It very rarely burns out, but when it does, or if it does, it needs to be replaced with the correct bulb. This bulb is switched on and off by this multiplex chip here and if you put in a replacement bulb that, bulb that draws too much current you'll burn out the part of the chip that turns the lamp on and off with stereo reception and these chips are hard to find nowadays and they're kind of pricey so you have to be careful this burns out you got to do an exact replacement these are still available you just have to look around on the internet for them this is the am rf and if board all on one board down here is the tone and volume control board this is your on off and volume control switch, balance, treble, and bass. And then your input selector switch is down here. This is the weighted flywheel I talked about in the first part of the video for the gyroscopic tuning. So that's kind of a nice touch, not something that any other model had ever had. It gives it a better feel than a standard dial shaft and a dial string. So that's what's inside. The next time you'll see this unit, it'll be well underway. Lots to figure out about why we have one channel that doesn't work. The power supply will be the first thing to be rebuilt. So here on the end of the, on the right-hand end of the chassis, these are the four output or power transistors. There's two per channel. The 2500 has a what's called a class AB push-pull amplifier design. So you have two transistors per channel. And then you also have, these are a little bit hard to see. These are little bias diodes and they're clamped to the aluminum heat sink. Their job is to adjust the voltage to the transistors as the heat sink warms up. The greater it heats up, the more it reduces the voltage. So you don't have sort of a runaway cascading thing happening with, happening with the amplifier. I have to look it up and see because I don't remember exactly, but I believe these are all Motorola brand uh, TO three transistors and these are kind of old school but used a lot in the 70s they're big beefy heavy duty output transistors i believe these may be germanium 
transistors, but I'm not positive. I have to go back and look it up and see. These are very low gain transistors. They usually have a gain of somewhere between maybe five and eight. So that's sort of the overview of this unit. Uh, I'm gonna do more videos as I work on it. And um, once we get the main unit done, then we'll be moving on to the 2510 master station. See you soon. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up on YouTube that way. Uh, you can leave comments down below. And if you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe to it. We would appreciate it. Have a good day. See you on the next video.